Okay, here we are. This is the first, my first lockup for the 2021 season, technically, right, even though it's in 2020. So these are pastel pinto ball pythons, and I'll get, I don't know, white weddings and all kinds of pastel pinto pies, all kinds of stuff. Hopefully, we'll see, fingers crossed. First time, by the way, I've, been, I've uh, actually bred ball pythons since 1987. I hate even saying that out loud. So, yes, I know they're bred all the time, and people produce thousands of ball pythons every year, but it's the first time for me since 1987. And you know what? I can't wait to get some babies, fingers crossed. I also did some other introductions this week. I introduced some of my granite spotted pythons, and those have been locked up quite a bit. And I'm currently cooling carpet pythons. I'm currently cooling uh, chondros and some conica sand boas. And that's going to be it for the first wave. The second wave, I'm going to be cooling and cycling my Amazon Basin Emeralds. And that's really what I'm going to focus on, the Savu pythons. I have five females ready to go this year. And I'm going to start cycling them probably sometime in March. So we'll see how that goes. Hey, so if you've been watching my last few videos especially, I've been talking a lot about my cycling techniques and what I've been doing. So currently, I am definitely in the process of cooling animals. And uh, we're going to start warming things up towards the later end of December. I'll start feeding again in January and start a lot of introductions towards the end of January. People ask me a couple of the same questions all the time. They say, when do you introduce your animals? Do you introduce your animals when you're cooling them, when you're warming them up, when you start feeding? Every species is different, honestly. Sometimes, like with the, um, I just showed you the ball pythons. I'm currently cooling them right now. They're a more readily easy to breed species, so I just threw them together, and sure enough, they locked up. My granite spotted pythons, I thought they might now, they might breed now too, you know, it, while they're still cool, and sure enough, they locked up. Um, so as far as depending on time, if you, tr you can try your animals when it's cool. If they don't breed, just separate them again and wait till it's, you start warming them up, but you can try different things. Um, the other question I get all the time is, and this is a key one, is it necessary to cycle animals in order to breed them? The answer, simple answer is no, you do not have to cycle your animals in order to breed them. However, should you cycle your animals in order to breed them? That's really the key question. And once again, the answer is yes, I would absolutely, absolutely cycle my animals uh, to breed them. And here's why. It's because if you go through a whole season and you don't cycle your animals and you introduce them uh, and they don't lock up, you're going to look back and say, wow, I wonder if I had cooled my animals down. I wonder if I had cooled my male down. That would have helped act as a catalyst with breeding. And sometimes it's too late. If you wait to the end of the season and you didn't cycle your animals, you might potentially lose an entire season if you don't cycle your animals. The more important reason you cycle your animals, however, is that, you know, especially with animals such as like diamond pythons, for example, I bring my diamond pythons down to uh, like 64, 65 degrees. Male fertility is key with diamond pythons, okay? You can breed diamond pythons and get eggs, no problem, but getting fertile eggs, that's the trick. So with all species, colder temperatures helps with male fertility, and that's the second reason and the most important reason why you should cycle your animals. So, hey, I know it's scary when you cycle animals. you got to cool them, especially if you're a newer keeper. The first time you start bringing those temperatures down to the high 70s or mid-70s at night, I know it's scary. But, you know, the good news is that, for example, last season I cooled about 16 to 18 females. Only one of my females was a, car a jungle carpet. She did get a little bit of a respiratory infection while I was cooling her. So I just quickly started bumping her taps. I, I quickly took her out of the breeding cycle. She's 100% healed right now. She's, she's perfect. I'm going to try her again this season. So I understand it's scary. But look, the reality is if you're going to breed these animals and give, give yourself the best success, the best chances of actually producing babies, then you really should go ahead and cycle your animals. Hey, if you watched my video, my last video that came out, you saw this little green sand zinnia. She was in my laundry room still. I had her in quarantine in my office, but I've had her now for coming up on a month. She's back in the room. She's 2020 baby green female sand zinnia, and she is kicking butt. And if you like her, you know what else you should like? My video right now. Can you do that for me, please? Like that, my video, and if you could subscribe to my video right now, that would also be amazing. So today is video number 16, and what do we have planned for you? Well, product spotlight. These focus cubes. Uh, that I've been seeing, these arboreal cages. They seem to be everywhere. Everybody in the arboreal world seems to be talking about these focus cubes, these new cages that have come out. And I was really recently able to uh, get my hands on one, and I'm excited to show you guys all its features and tell you what I really think about these focus cubes. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about, we have a breeder spotlight. My buddy, Buddy Buscemi, had a clutch of diamond pythons this season, so we're going to show off his adults and show off some of his babies. Um, diamond pythons, as I mentioned earlier in the video, I was talking about breeding them. They have just been really difficult to come by. 
by this year. Some of the guys who produce a lot of babies every year for some reason seem to have some issues and were so few available. So hopefully anybody out there looking for diamond python babies, I'm going to uh, show you what Buddy has available. And lastly, we're going to talk about scenting. And we, we have newborn babies, how to scent a fuzzy pinky or whatever prey item you're using, how to do it properly. Hopefully I'm going to give you some tips there that are going to really help you out a lot when it comes to scenting. So why don't we just jump into the product spotlight. I am seeing focused cubed habitat cages everywhere. I'm a long time arboreal guy, so I'm on all the arboreal forums and all the pages, and I keep seeing people talk about these focused cubed habitats. Uh, so it piqued my interest, and I couldn't wait to get my hands on one. And interest of full disclosure, this is not my cage. I'm going to be delivering this amazing cage with that amazing animal in the back. That is a sickness line animal from Bill Stegel, who's over in Texas. And I'm sure you're familiar with Bill's uh, sickness line of animals. So, guys, does it get any more Texas than this? I have a cage made in Texas, a snake produced in Texas. But wait, here's the best part. Stephen and Ashley Howdy own and make uh, uh, Focus Cubed Habitat cages, okay? And again, their last name is Howdy, H-A-U-D-E-Y, and they're from Texas. Okay, that'd be like somebody from Hawaii with the last name Aloha. That's what I'm talking about. That's how Texas we're, we're talking about right here. Anyway, this thing is so tricked out. It is the Cadillac of cages. The best way for me to describe it, it's, it's pretty much the sexiest cage I think I've ever seen in my life. Has all the acrylic on the top, has all the acrylic on the sides. Um, these carbon fiber perches. These things are ultimate lightweight. They're so easy to clean. And I think they were top speed at about 130 miles an hour. I mean, these things are just crazy. Um, as you can see, just by looking at the cage, it looks just so high tech. All right, so let's talk about what you guys really want to know. I mean, a cage like this one is all tricked out. This one's probably an upwards, I would say, of $500 plus. But the base cage is $259 uh, plus shipping, okay? So they're very reasonably priced. This is a 24 inch by 24 inch. The thing about Steven that they really focus on him and Ashley is that they're all about options and about customer control, okay? So uh, from the hardware to the, the, the cage itself, I mean, the amount of colors and options you can get, it's just kind of crazy. Um, and the thing I love about this most, guys, it's a family business. Steven and Ashley are just starting out with this. They've had a lot of success so far, so I'd love to, to support a family business, especially with a family business that makes such an incredible product. Um, you should also know this particular cage, it's about four to ten weeks out as far as delivery. You know, COVID is slowing everything down right now as far as, uh, you know, delivery on things. Um, what I love about this cage, too, is it has dimmable lights, uh, which I'll show you guys in a second. It has the five and five and carver purchase, which I told you guys about. It's ultra lightweight, and there's, they're available in any thickness you can imagine. Um, the cage itself is uh, the glass part is all acrylic. And Stephen even sends you, they're, they're so anal and so detail controlled over there that he actually sent me a rag and a pair of gloves to handle the cage. I mean, that's, that's pretty crazy. I've never seen anything like that. And as far as the wiring itself, uh, the wiring, the way he wired the entire cage, it's just, again, the word is meticulous. I know you guys are going to want to see a quick close-up too of Bill's sickness animal. That's a male, just an incredible animal. And at this age, I got to tell you, I know it's going to hold all that black. It's just, I love this animal. So I wanted to show you guys because I know you'd yell at me if I didn't show you Bill's animal. I just wanted to show you guys a quick picture of the side of this cage with the acrylic on the side. And I also wanted to show you the acrylic on the top. Now again, these are options, guys. These are not standard in the typical cage. But again, I just wanted to show you the, one of the few of the many, many options that Stephen and Ashley make available on these cages. Okay, guys, I just wanted to demonstrate that dimmer to you. And what's really great about the dimmer is, like I said, Stephen and Ashley have thought of everything, is that, you know, now you can dim the lights, so when the lights come on in the morning, the animals doesn't go from zero to 100 as far as blindness. So I love that feature they put in there. I can tell you the cages I currently use in my own snake room do not have a dimmer feature. Um, I also wanted to mention is that, again, I'm going to put the contact information on the bottom of the screen for Focus Cubed Habitats. But, you know, another question I get from you guys all the time are these Cambro boxes. When I show my enclosures, my, my room, uh, these Cambro boxes, people always want to know, you know, where to get them and where can I get a, uh, a rack that holds these. Well, that's the cool thing. Please go check out Focus Cubed Habitat's website. They made a Cambro box holder like nothing I've ever seen before. And I can tell you when I'm ready to order more Cambro boxes and holders, Stephen and Ashley are definitely the place I want to go to. So bottom line, it's an amazing cage. It is plug and play. You get this thing in. You do not have to assemble it. You just take it out of the box. And when I tell you guys, wait till you see if you get one of these cages, how it's packed. I mean, it probably took me 20 minutes just to unpack it, but there was not a single scratch, dent, or anything on it. No crack whatsoever. Um, Steve and Ashley are just super nice people. I've been just speaking to him, asking him a bunch of questions about the cage, and uh, just super responsive, so I know you're going to really like them. And so give them a try. Focus Cube Habitats. I'm a huge fan. I'll definitely be a customer in the future, and uh, please go check them out.
Hey, before we get into today's breeder spotlight, I quickly wanted to show you guys these perches um, that are going to be hitting the market in the next few weeks probably. My friend David Brahms at Specialty Enclosure Designs uh, started making these perches with a wood grain tone finish to them. And they have a nice texture. They're nice and rough as well. What I love about these perches, you can make any terrestrial cage and arboreal cage by adding these perches. And Specialty Enclosure Designs, I talk about David all the time. The guy's nonstop. Between David Brahms and uh, MJ who hosts Trap Talk Radio, those guys make me feel so lazy. They're like nonstop. They're everywhere all the time. So anyway, love these perches. I'll be talking about them again in a future video. Um, so Buddy Buscemi is a friend of mine. You've heard Buddy's name before on my channel. Um, he produces chondros. He produces a lot of different animals. But I want to talk about his diamond pythons today because you guys out there are always asking me, where can I get diamond pythons from? It's been a really rough year with diamond pythons, so I'm so happy to report that Buddy is going to be making three pair available, and I will put Buddy's contact information on the bottom of the screen. I'll also put up a picture of his sire, the dam, and a picture of one of his available babies. I can tell you, for me last year, I had a uh, my female diamond python. She went egg bound, and I eventually lost her. And I know a few other big diamond breeders out there uh, just had a rough year last year, so that's probably why there's such shortage of diamond pythons. But again. Good news, Buddy Buscemi is going to have some beautiful babies available, and I'm making them available here before Buddy puts them on Facebook or anywhere else, so you guys have first shot at them. And uh, again, reach out to Buddy, and if you're interested in some baby diamond pythons, he'd be a great guy to buy from. Hey guys, what I want to talk about right now is uh, scenting. Specifically, I want to get into uh, scenting using the gecko scents, the lizard scents, and the frog scents from Reptilinks. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them, but Reptilinks sells all those scents. Um, I tried them for the first time last year when I had some baby anteries or some children's pythons that were just being difficult feeders for me. I tried it and it worked like a charm. This little Savu, as you know, I hatched out this year. And uh, after a few attempts of, you know, frozen thawed, heated up, and live in all different ways, I just tried the lizard scent on this animal and it worked perfectly and the best thing about it is after you use the lizard scent or the gecko scent wherever you use it for about three times um, you can then easily wean the animal off of that that's what I love about it so let me show you how to use it and let me tell you a little bit about those scents so let's get this little guy back in its enclosure and so this is the scent this thing is pretty much empty right now this is there's a G on the bottom that's the gecko scent I get them from Repti Lynx so as far as cost guys this is where Repti Lynx kind of gets you a little bit because each one of these little containers it's forty dollars for each that little container now the good news is this thing will last for years it'll last you forever or they sell a three pack for ninety dollars so you're thinking to yourself well maybe I'll just buy two for eighty as opposed to the three pack for ninety but guess what there is a minimum order of $90 on these. So you have to wind up getting a three pack and that's how they kind of get you on that. I wish they sold them individually for $40 plus shipping. They do not. Another thing you need to know about these is that there is no preservatives in any of these scents. So they come frozen. That's how they're delivered to you. They're delivered frozen solid and you store them in your freezer. And after you use them every time, you have to put them in your freezer because there's no preservatives. And if you do not put them in your freezer, um, they're going to go bad. So make sure you keep them in your freezer when you're not using them. And each time you get to frost them. Okay. So how do I do it? If you watch my previous videos, the three key things you should have in your snake room, well, this was one of them. This is the seventh generation hand soap. It's scent free, it's chemical free, it's odor free. So I'm going to show you exactly how I scent my animals. And whether you're using chick scent for chondros or gecko scent or lizard scent or whatever you're trying, if you're trying to get a carpet python that's currently on mice, you're trying to get it on rats and you want to wash the mouse before you scent it with a rat scent, um, again, seventh generation hand soap. So here's how I do it. Why the rodent is frozen, I'm going to show you guys on this little fuzzy mouse. Solid frozen fuzzy mouse, right? Just take some cold water, seven generation soap. I put a little squirt on my hand like that. Come over to the sink, get it nice and lathery, suds it up a little bit. And then just make sure I wash it off really well. And that'll pretty much do it. Just by doing that, you will get the scent of the fuzzy mouse off the fuzzy mouse. So now what I'm going to do is just, I would leave it out now for the rest of the day or whatever. I come back tonight and I'll feed it. It'll be thoroughly defrosted. So now when do we put the scent on? Well, it's completely defrosted right now. I would heat up the rodent first using a heat lamp or whatever you use. I would heat it up first and I would just take its nose. I would put it in that container like that and just dip it. It's got a nice wet scent on it now. I would do it maybe on the head a little bit. It's completely covered now. It's defrosted. It's warmed. It has a scent. This is exactly what I do. I use tongs. I order it to the uh, Savu Python. Its tongue was flicking instantly, and within about 30 to 45 seconds, it grabbed it. So anyway, 
That's how you use those scents. I'm a big fan of them. And again, I want to just say one thing is, listen, if your babies don't eat right away, you don't feel like you have to start scenting immediately. Like with the Sabu Python, it's almost six weeks old by the time I even try scenting it. Especially certain animals like diamond pythons, I could tell you are black-headed pythons. I wouldn't even try feeding those animals for at least until they were two months old. But in any event, if you have to use scents and you want to try them, the Reptilink scents, uh, they work really well. So I would definitely give them a try if you're working with Andoresia or small Liasis species. You guys remember Riley? I never name any of my snakes, but I got him from Steve Volk, and Steve Volk had given him the name Riley. So I call him Riley, and hopefully he's going to produce some babies for me this year. He's a 2015 basin male. In any event, thanks you guys so much for watching my video for, uh, with me today. I'll see you guys in a couple weeks, but as always, uh, they need our support now more than ever. U.S. Ark, they do so much for us and ask so little from us, so if you could please make a donation. It's $5 a month. That's all it is to US Arc, and I will see you guys shortly with video number 17 in two weeks. Who has the best YouTube channel? Me?